It's a real pleasure to be here and a real pleasure to speak to you. Um, through very tenacious research at Universities UK, I'm able to announce that Ashford is the fourth best place to live in the United Kingdom. Uh, I, I personally will make no comment about that at all whatsoever, but I need to see the evidence which wasn't there on the uh, r journey from the railway station. Um, the, the title of what I'm going to speak about is Higher Education Reform, Revolution or Evolution. And that is underneath uh, what is an, an incredibly important uh, theme for your conference, sustainability and survival. And those are topics which obsess the senior managers across the university sector at the moment, and understandably so. But I have to tell you, after 11 years as a vice chancellor, I can't remember a time when we didn't collectively worry about sustainability and survival. The focus of our concerns has changed considerably in that time, and I will argue, actually, somewhat for the better. But I don't underestimate the scale of the challenge facing universities at the moment in particular. In fact, universities are having to adapt to what one commentator, Chris Cook, writing in the Financial Times, has called a very quiet Big Bang. I think it's worth taking a long view uh, and just having a little bit of a historical perspective. Uh, when I was um, uh, first arrived as a vice chancellor of Bristol, I, I managed to come across some financial statements for the university from the early 1970s. And the financial statements were really, really easy. It had government grant, £8,750,000, expenditure, £8,750,000. All your buildings were built on grants that you got from University Grants Committee. And even 10 years ago, if we were talking about sustainability and survival, we'd have been talking almost exclusively about public funding. In the previous two decades, the unit of funding per student had fallen by 37%, while numbers had increased by 88%. An efficiency gain, I remind you, by the way, only beaten by the computer industry. In financial terms, English universities were collectively in deficit with no prospect of a return to healthy and necessary surpluses. The Labour government had a plan to increase participation to 50% of 18 to 30-year-olds, but no plan to pay for it. At that time, research commissioned by Universities UK identified a £6.5 million backlog in infrastructure investment. Not least because across the country, ageing 60s buildings constructed during the last major phase of university expansion were nearing the end of their useful life. No significant refurbishment or major new building was undertaken in the University of Bristol between 1975 and 1997. And in human resource terms, universities were struggling to implement the recommendations of the BET report, modernizing pay structures, improving salaries to make them competitive with other parts of the economy, and improving management and training. At that time, Universities UK calculated that the cost to cover these deficits and backlogs would be in the order of £10 billion over the three-year spending period that that comprehensive spending review was assessing. Although universities did derive income from a variety of sources, including unregulated fees for international postgraduate students, the majority of our undergraduate provision was funded by the taxpayer, and the majority of research funding also came from the state. Therefore, our future success depended to a very large extent on the decisions politicians made about where to spend taxpayers' monies. And those decisions were influenced by politics. Despite the enormous reach of our universities, they were not perceived as vote winners. That was 10 years ago. And consider the changes that have occurred through that in all parts of the United Kingdom. I'm going to set out some of those changes, but in doing so, I have to make it clear that I'm going to concentrate on England and the current English reforms. But during the same period, 
we have seen real divergence between England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and I think a divergence which is going to increase over the next few years. So in England, from 2002 onwards, we saw considerable increases in public investment in both teaching and research. As in all parts of the UK, universities are now recognized as critical to our economic future. Tony Blair said that when he came into government in 1997, he was told by advisors that it was a waste of money to invest in higher education. What happened in the event was that the Labour government chose to ignore that advice and did indeed create substantially more money for us to become and continue to become world class. That government recognised, just as the current one does, that universities are the, one of the only really outstanding industries in the UK. And I use industry in, uh, in inverted commas. Without universities at the top of global league tables, the UK will be considered considerably weaker and less likely to retain our position in GDP league tables either. Significantly, both the current government and the previous one have staked considerable political capital in introducing tuition fees for undergraduate education. Now, in the toughest economic times the UK has seen since the 1930s, the universities, of course, are feeling the squeeze. The difference is we will now have considerably more control over our own futures. Over time, the shift from state funding to fee income will deliver greater independence for university. So, for example, from this sector, this September, the proportion of sector's income, which comes from government sources, will fall to about 40%, and that will fall increasingly over the future years. In many ways, this is good news, because we will be decreasingly dependent on politicians and the decisions that they have to make about relative priorities, especially in the current financial and political climate. And let's have a look at the current funding climate and the reforms. I want to start with the, I want to come on to the wider implications of the package of reforms in a moment, but let's start with money. In the 2010 spending review, the average cut in departmental expenditure was 11.7%. Biz, our uh, ministry, did considerably worse, suffering a 29% cut. In 2012, that translated, 2012-13, that has translated into an 18% cut in the recurrent funding to higher education institutions. Research funding was protected. And our situation, in view of the funding reforms of the government, is that despite that reduction in public funding for teaching, over this spending review, public expenditure in higher education, through the grant and through fee income, will be actually increasing because of the state government-backed loans. I mentioned to Matthew beforehand, we would be facing a very, very different conference today if we were looking at each other talking about an uncompensated 25% cut in our teaching grants, which is what many other places in the public sector are looking at the equivalent of. Now, for most universities, they will feel that increase. This, of course, is only part of the picture, and I'll come back to some other uh, current reforms, such as number controls, in a moment. But sticking with public funding, the March budget made clear that there will be further cuts to come in departmental budgets, probably of between 3.8% a year between 2015 and 2017. The government could reduce the average departmental cut by further slashing the welfare budget, but that may be difficult to achieve from a political point of view, especially in the aftermath of this month's local elections. And remember, the projected 3.8% cut is an average. Biz did worse than the average last time. The government has been buffeted, buffeted by poor public reaction to relatively small scale, scale budget measures, the granny tax, the pasty tax, the charity tax, as well as bigger extents to cut expenditure, remember the battles over welfare reform. So it's highly likely that cuts will be bigger 
than last time, but the political climate is more difficult. The easy cuts have been made. So, as Sir Alan Langlands has pointed out, the higher education sector looks relatively well protected in comparison to other sectors. The question for universities is whether BES will, again, face a larger than average cut, and if so, how will that translate into university finances? And I think this is now really a crucially important fact. As I already said, that the proportion of university funds which comes from the state will fall to about 40% following the shift to higher fees this September. Nevertheless, we are still dependent on public funding for research, as well as supporting the high cost subjects and activities such as widening participation. If university budgets were to be targeted in the next spending round, what else could be cut? The research budget and the all important science ring fence which uh, uh, protects it, could start to look rather vulnerable. We can make a pretty good case that an economically suicidal government would want to cut back on research that drives innovation, that only an economically suicidal government would want to cut back on research that drives innovation and inward investment in the UK. But it's really rather hard to see what more can be taken from the teaching grant because there's so little of it left. In fact, by the end of three years, there will be universities that to all intents and purposes will be barely receiving any public funding at all. If they don't have big science in their undergraduate teaching and they weren't getting a significant amount of QR, they actually will be having the vast percentage of their funding from outside the public sector. <coughs> Meanwhile, student support system puts enormous pressure on government finances it's quite difficult to limit the expenditure. The cost to government in terms of subsidy to support the loan repayment, the so-called RAB charge, depends on factors which are both outside ministers' control and unpredictable, such as what will graduate earnings be over the next 10 to 20 years and what will employment profiles look like. So already, start with the stark prospect of cuts in the next spending round may be more likely by an overspend currently on student support. So to summarize, what would we really like as these substantial reforms bed in is a period of stability. We are very unlikely to get funding and fee income as they are only part of this. First, uh, uh, changes that the government has come up is the determination to create more competition in the sector. The way student numbers are controlled is undergoing a radical shift. You may be familiar with the fact that the government has made it possible for universities to recruit an unlimited number of students with qualifications equivalent to AAB at A level. To do this without increasing the number of places in the system, they have had to restrict numbers in the rest of the pot limiting the number of non-AAB students each individual university can recruit. Alongside this, the government has withdrawn a further 20,000 places to be reallocated to universities or FE colleges, charging an average fee of less than 7,500. This core and margin policy is designed to push down fee levels and thus push down the cost to the government of supporting fee loans. A couple of weeks ago, ministers announced that they will go further next year, pushing the grade boundary down to ABB and increasing the margin of places available for lower cost institutions. Now, this is good news for some universities, but possibly bad news for others. Universities who can't or don't want to lower their fees to compete for places from the margin and who can't recruit additional students from the pool of candidates at the highest grades, may find they are forced to shrink or diversify away from full-time ho home and EU undergraduates. And of course, that is the classic overseas uh, market. But at the same time, we have a government policy on immigration, which is likely to continue squeezing international student recruitment. Actually, at the moment, numbers of international applications and enrolments across the sector are up, although it has to be said it's very patchy. Some institutions have seen decreases of up to 40% in their overseas applications, 
and some markets, such as India and postgraduate teaching, have also been substantially hit. But we have seen considerable progress in negotiations with the Home Office on policy detail. I can't go into it here, but if you had seen what the Home Office's ideas were at the very beginning of their uh, uh, clamping down on immigration, where we got to with students is we should regard as a major, major lobbying success. However, a new rhetoric from the Immigration Minister, Damien Green, causes us anxiety. The government has started to talk about quantity, quality, not quantity, in international student recruitment. The Migration Advisory Committee will be apparently asked to look at which international students create the most value. And we know that as long as the government remains committed to reducing net migration to the tens of thousands, the fact that international students are the largest group does put us on a, uh, a, a, a different ends of the negotiating spectrum. At Universities UK, we think the only sensible solution, and one that is used in the US, in Canada, and in Australia, is to take overseas students out of the calculation of net migration for policy purposes. It seems sense because students, overseas students, are just temporary migrants. Because of this, you only also get a short-term benefit in net migration by reducing the numbers coming in. If you reduce the numbers coming in, you reduce the numbers going out, usually within five years. Because of this, you get what Martin Ruse of the Migration Observatory calls a net migration bounce. In other words, there isn't a long-term impact on uh, uh, net migration. So the problem, as I see it, is the government ha is firmly committed in part of uh, what, uh, the government and the part that has to deal with migration, and migration is a significant issue for uh, the, uh, the voters on the street, for the people in the United Kingdom. We cannot underestimate their anxiety about that. But a migration policy that is counterproductive economically, particularly around international students, uh, and which is also likely, numerically, in the final analysis, to fail. Now, in government, probably the only thing that trumps migration on the doorstep is the economy. So we have to do more to demonstrate the benefits that international students create. We know, for in instance, that the international export earnings are already worth about eight billion pounds a year from international students, and by 2025, they could be worth 17 billion. And we have to convince government that this is more important uh, than, than the current interpretation of migration. In the meantime, this is a major risk factor for universities. Changes can be rapid and unpredictable. Some of you may have been around when SARS occurred in, uh, in, the, in Southeast Asia, and suddenly numbers of students coming from Southeast Asia dropped off a cliff within a year. Um, international activities are increasingly important to us. Loss of the highly trusted sponsored status by UKBA uh, can be a really catastrophic to a university. It can lead to the almost immediate turning off of an income stream in the order of 20, 40, or 50 million pounds. We also expect government to legislate, eventually, to make it easier for private providers of higher education to offer degrees, including gaining their own degree awarding powers and university title. While legislation has been postponed, these private education providers are already expanding rapidly. Under the new system, students who study on courses which have been approved by BIS, private provider courses, will be able to access loan funding to cover up to £6,000 of their fees. These private providers will not be subject either to the fee cap or to student number controls, so we could see very rapid growth in this part of the sector, probably amongst institutions with quite a clearly defined route. And, by the way, take note, there are some very serious investors who are extremely keen to get into and expand their private provider operations in UK higher education. And why should they be there? Because 
higher education in the UK has a fantastic reputation built on the performance of the universities that you work for right across the sector. The future prospects are phenomenal. Demand is rising and will continue to rise. The education and research produced by universities has never been more important in helping individuals, businesses, and government achieve their goals. If new entrants to the market can succeed, surely established universities can. The question is to what extent they can do this and preserve what is unique about the way they contribute to society. We know universities don't just deliver high quality teaching. They also provide a hub for local communities, contribute to the advancement of public understanding, to policy and to social mobility. They are increasingly business-like, but they are not mere businesses. To recap, the current set of reforms constitute a sizable experiment with uncertain results. Uh, Nicola Dandridge and I wrote a letter to David Willits around further deregulation in which we could identify 15 variables in higher education that had not yet resolved their outcome. And these are unfinished reforms. The consequences of the changes already in place may not be known for a number of years, and the final shape of the landscape is resolved. However, in the short term, there is clearly scope for substantial instability, and taken together, it is clear that universities' positions will diverge. Across the country, they have been making important preparations. Uh, I was describing to Matthew that uh, higher education as a collective has gone quite quiet recently. And I think the reason is that the sector has become, to use the sociologist term, quite atomized. In other words, the senior teams are sitting in their universities thinking about how they take their university across the, uh, the, the next two to three years' challenges rather than addressing some of the uh, grand narratives of higher education. That, in a sense, happened with the fees reform. And so there's a, a kind of stillness and a, and, and, a, and a feeling that people are thinking, well, how are we going to get our university across uh, uh, these uh, next two or three years? And that is a very individual challenge, I think, for uh, universities. We're in quite a healthy uh, uh, financial position. Sector-wide surpluses have been built up. But I, I, they've been built up to about 4% of turnover. And I'd like to draw your attention to a study by JM Consulting in 2003 that showed for a state's sustainability alone, we should be having surpluses of 5 to 7%. Never mind HR, by the way, human resources sustainability, just for a state's sustainability. So in the midst of all of this, what's the role of you? Successful adaptation is going to require some very careful and very uh, intelligent positioning by individual universities. Universities UK has a role in this by monitoring these changes and helping to supply the data and analysis. But in a sector where people are such a key component of success, it is clear that human resource teams will be pivotal. The importance of managing change cannot be overestimated. An effective HR strategy can make a critical contribution to leading a university through difficult times. First, by helping to ensure the institution has the right people in the right jobs to address the challenges presented by the new environment. Second, by managing the inevitable workforce changes which flow from the need to adapt. And thirdly, by taking a leading role in communicating the changes so that staff are clear about what's happening and why and what that part they play in securing the success of the university. For me, this final element is probably one of the most important. I'll return to it in a moment, but let's start with the other two. Human resource teams find themselves at the front line of organizational change. Many universities have had to restructure, to reduce staffing levels, change the composition of the workforce, either through natural wastage or recruitment phrases, or when necessary, through redundancies. 
Not only do those processes require considerable management and leadership capabilities, they can also, obviously, have a damaging effect on morale, which can undermine the efforts of the organization to achieve the objectives it has set for itself. There are some excellent examples of HR teams which have handled this well. The University of Creative Arts, which managed to record improved staff morale, uh, according to a staff survey, during a turbulent period in which the university implemented its new strategic plan. Initiatives by, run by the university HR team to help staff through what was understandably a difficult time, including career workshops, coaching for managers, drop-in sessions, and bespoke CV reviews. And I know all of the universities will have made similar efforts to make sure their staff know that they're valued even when the pressure on university means the strategy has to change. But there's no hiding the fact that for many institutions there will have to be a renewed focus on efficiency, there'll have to be a focus on getting more for less. As you know, Universities UK has been leading a sector-wide work on efficiency and effectiveness in higher education, and indeed your chair, Matthew Knight, was a member of our task force. It's essential we do this, uh, uh, not just because of the public pressure on uh, pu uh, public resources, which I've described, but in, we have to demonstrate to our politicians that we can provide value for public money. But there's another dynamic, which is that the shift to a student-centered market means that students are more, a lot, much more likely, and rightly in my view, to take a keener interest in how their fee income is spent. And this affects all aspects of uni university life, including human resource functions themselves. The University's UK report highlighted the need for a more coordinated approach to benchmarking initiatives in universities, for example, by developing generic tools that can be adapted by individual universities or groups of universities. It also identified a need for UHR to work with others to develop a coordinated approach to resources that help organizations manage change. And of course, we have to look for opportunities to share services where this is possible and in the strategic interest of all parties involved. And the recent VHE changes, which we've been lobbying for for six years, should help with this. Within this, we are also increasingly aware of a pull in the other direction, which is that universities are increasingly in competition with each other. And subject, by the way, to competition law. Uh, so universities need to tread a fine line between learning from each other which has always been in the spirit of higher education, and falling foul of the Competition Commission. That said, the fact that many universities are facing common challenges means there is enormous, enormous scope for us to learn from each other. Another example that was featured in uh, the University of UK's report was the University of Cumbria, which undertook a review of internal HR processes as part of a wider effort to improve efficiency across the university. They reduced 56 HR processes to 32 and introduced self-service elements where possible. It's an example of how improving efficiency doesn't just mean cutting costs. Cumbria found that the process resulted in demonstrable improvements in the speed and accuracy of activities such as expense claims and holiday bookings. And I won't tell you here how many people had to sign off an expense claim in the University of Bristol. Not only has the process saved a considerable sum of money, it's also created a model which can be applied to similar initiatives in other departments. These processes, hard though they may be, can result in stronger universities. And of course, the hardest questions are often not what can I do, but what can I stop doing? And that brings me, I think, to the third essential role of human resource teams that play in institutional change, communications. Achieving success in the rapidly changing environment I have described requires a very clear strategy. Everyone from the senior team down needs a very clear understanding of what you're about, what makes your university the destination of choice for a certain group of students, staff, and business partners, how can you differentiate yourself from competitors, including further education colleges and private providers, and in some cases, it is going to require how you do some judicious pruning to concentrate on real strengths. 
That's what universities across the sector are doing right now. Some of you will have seen an article in the Financial Times two weeks ago by Andrew Policano, Dean of the Business School at the University of California, Irvine, writing about what UK universities could learn from US business schools. He said, and I quote, US business schools, understand how to add value in a way that captures market square, share. They ask tough questions. What are we really good at? Where can we be distinctive? Are there new programs we can offer to students? What should we not do? Why should a student choose to enroll in our school rather than our competitors? Should we extend our brand through branch campuses in new geographic markets or via distance education? All of that sounds like quite a good prescription for UK universities, but he goes on to say that UK universities should adopt an accountability framework that provides transparency and aligns revenue and costs for each unit. It is critical that every university assesses the quality and net revenue production in each area. Resource allocations should follow that result. The areas with high quality and high profitability should be expanded, and those with low quality and negative cash, cash flow should be downsized, I quote. Now that, I would argue, is a very different proposition, and one which, as I'm sure you can imagine, had the letters page of the T Financial Times in quite a flutter. Universities have a proud tradition of cross-subsidizing, loss-making activity in the name of intellectual endeavor and greater good. I mean, just look at our dogged insistence on continuing to offer undergraduate education to UK domiciled students during the very long period where it was basically a loss-making activity. And despite the new focus uh, uh, on impact in the research excellence framework and grant application process, I imagine every major research institution funds a number of projects out of their own resources which involve very clever people working on things that nobody else really understands, simply out of a belief that they are A, very clever, and B, maybe onto something. <laughs> Quantum photonics is the one in my university, which I've never understood ever. That kind of unbusinesslike cross-subsidization has been essential to the contribution our universities have made throughout the centuries of their existence. And although I'm not a scholar of the humanities myself, I firmly believe that universities have to be more about scientific discovery, medical advance, and economic contribution. They also have to be about the kind of rigorous intellectual inquiry, abstract intellectual inquiry that you see in the arts and humanities and social sciences. But in case you think I'm getting too sentimental, I don't think any of these beliefs, passionately held though they may be, can help us answer some of the uncomfortable questions that Policano's article poses, i.e., can you preserve the character and broad range of social benefits of universities and be business-like in an era of decreasing public support? Can we move closer towards a closer link between sources of their funds without compromising our rich contribution to national life? especially as competitors emerge who have none of our sentimental att uh, attachment or, can I say, philosophically driven attachment to the public good. There are those that say that, uh, that university leaders like myself are losing their way uh, uh, and not recognizing what I've just described in the role of universities. For example, Stefan Collini's recent book, What Are Universities For?, argues that politicians and education bureaucrats have failed to understand and respect the broader purpose of our universities. They have been subjected to an audit culture that devours learning and makes accountants kings, to quote Chris Patton. If I wanted to be provocative, I could argue in return that without a clear focus on the bottom line and without making the arguments which are most likely to appeal to the Treasury, Universities could still be in the position they risked 10 years ago at the end of a very long period of failing resources, continuing to offer a broadish contribution to society as our cherished reputation for quality seeps away. By being businesslike and by focusing on what we do well, 
and by making the argument that universities have a central role in the economy, we do not ignore the other aspects of their contribution. We protect them. We create the space to cross-subsidize where it matters. And I have said in many, many places that the future strength of universities relies on them understanding that they are primarily educational establishments. Educo, derived from the Latin, I lead out. And if we do not continue to have that as our primary focus, thereby lies the road to hell over a period of time. It's absolutely essential. But it's naive to think that market forces won't change us. They will. We will probably have to do less in certain areas in our institutions. Challenge is to do less better. And we have to do this without damaging the intellectual and society, social character that makes our university special and, in my view, a privilege to work in. Universities are, by and large, fantastically strong, resilient, and adaptable institutions, staffed, and we shouldn't underestimate this, by very clever, very committed, very value-driven people. People who, by the way, have enabled UK universities to punch way above their weight during the long period in which the system was seriously underfunded by international comparisons. These people are not, by and large, motivated by the bottom line. We have to be aware that the necessary shift to a more uh, uh, bottom line driven culture doesn't drive out our greatest assets or demotivate our staff to the extent that they can't work effectively. I think we have seen this happen in some of our public services. Doctors who love their jobs but don't like working for the NHS. Teachers who love teaching but are demoralized by the culture of the school system. That's why we have to pay close attention to what motivates our staff. That's why we mustn't get so hooked on responding to change that we forget the importance of continuity. Fundamentally, I believe what universities have done in the past, teach students, conduct research, advance scholarship, connect with business, the public sector, and local communities, they will continue to go. Ten years from now, I think we will look back and be surprised at how quickly and successfully the sector has responded to the considerable change in its relationships with government and students. Uncertainty in one area will lead us to create opportunities elsewhere, for example, to collaborate with her other universities, to form overseas partnerships, to develop transnational activities. All over the world, there are countries that look to the UK and wonder how we're going to recreate our system. Of course, one of the ways they can do it is by poaching our best staff. And we need to understand that there are parts of the world in which checkbooks are wide open to talent from the UK. But equally, there are opportunities opening up all over the world for our institutions with a strong offer. I mentioned Tony Blair earlier. In that same article, he talked about a higher education being in a state of permanent revolution. I think that overstates the case. We are seeing a substantial shift in our business model. It's rapid, and the results are uncertain. But there will be far more continuity than change, and indeed, continuity will be one of the features of the success stories. Is this about revolution? No, I think it's about evolution. And for those of you that are evolutionary biologists, you may remember that there is a concept called conservation in which a gene is so important that if it mutates, the protein that it encodes for doesn't function and that is uh, fatal to the organism. And therefore, the sequence of the gene remains conserved over generations and between species. And I was walking down the Via Zamboni in uh, Bologna and Bologna is the oldest university in the world. And as I walked down the street uh, of the Via Zamboni, which is the university street, the students were out, and they looked just like students that would have been doing that 400 years ago, 500 years ago. There were posters up on the wall. They were talking with each other. The fundamental purpose of the university and its fundamental mechanism of operating hadn't uh, changed. And my argument is that isn't conservatism. It's conservation. 
Universities behaving in that fashion is so important to society that they conserve the behavior to protect the species. And that's what's going to go on. We're going to have evolution, but with conservation of our fundamental principles, and it will be accelerated evolution. But I, evolution is often like that. Perhaps I can finally say that the one thing that evolution rarely does is produce weaker species. Thank you very much. Right, I'm chairing this session, apparently. Uh, so we've got two microphones, um, one over there and one over there. Uh, there's about half an hour. I won't keep you from lunch any longer than that. Please feel free to ask any questions, and please identify who you are and where you're from, if that's possible. Have we got somebody? We have a lady there, and then a lady over there, right? Can... Thank you. Do you want to start? Okay. Hello. I'm Margaret Ayres from the University of Kent. Um, Vice-Chancellors clearly have an important role in terms of this time of change. I wonder if you can say a bit about what you think the capabilities are needed from our Vice-Chancellors. Right. Um... <laughs> It's very, very interesting. The role of a vice, I think getting the role of a vice chancellor clear in the institution's mind is really important. Uh, and it depends to a degree on institutional size. But if you take a large institution, the vice chancellor in this modern world has, I would say, three or four key roles. The first is that they are the strategic leader of the organization. It is their job with their organization and with their governing body to determine the strategic future of the university. And a vice chancellor worth their salt has to be able to say what they think their university will look like in five or 10 years. Secondly, they have to close lead a relatively tight senior team. And that will mean probably a limited number of direct reports. Thirdly, they're crucially important in the culture of the organization. They set the culture of the organization. And if the organization is going through a cultural change, it will depend a lot on the personality of the vice chancellor. And finally, crucially, they are the main point of internal and external representation. In other words, it's them that's going out, them doing the lobbying, them as the face of the university, and it's them that are also involved in the internal communications that are so important. What you'll notice I have not said is that they have a profoundly important operational role. Because I don't think that the vice chancellor actually should, after they've become bedded in in an institution, have a profoundly operational role. And it was John Lowrice, the uh, uh, previous registrar at the University of Southampton, that said, a vice chancellor should do what only a vice chancellor can do. In other words, if somebody else can do it, your vice chancellor shouldn't be doing it. Because your vice chancellor should be doing those roles that you have employed her or him to do. Now, if you then look at it in that broad strategic thing, I think just at the moment, it is about leading your institution through this period of instability. It's about bringing the intelligence back to the institution. It's about knowing your institution. It's about having the best senior team you can. And it's about some very serious scenario planning in an area of instability. And that's all about leadership, leadership, leadership. And it will be different for different sizes of institutions. Um, so that, that's my view on the, on the role of vice chancellorial leadership just at the moment. Please. Thank you. Perry and Johnson, Newcastle University. Um, I, I, I very much like the idea of evolution with conservation, but some of my uh, colleagues, I think, might interpret that as meaning they don't have to change at all, mm. so the emphasis would be on the conservation. And I just wondered what ways you found are, are most effective to communicate and, and lead change. Yeah. Um First of all, what an outstanding institution you come from. <laughs> I just wanted, and where did I graduate again? I just remember. 
Um, so uh, I, I think, and again, I think this is very institution dependent. And can I be, um, one of the things that in, in a very traditional university like my own university, the idea that you can invoke tectonic change rapidly is an unachievable ambition. And it's about an iterative uh, state, statement of, of why we're doing this and what benefits it will bring. And then those benefits finally becoming evident to uh, the organization. Um, and it, it, we, it, I mean, it, you know, I, 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 am, I lead because I'm allowed to lead by my organization. My organization doesn't want me to lead it. It'll make that plain very quickly. Therefore, it's incredibly consensual, and you have to build consensus and take people through with that. Now, in different managerial structures, in more dirigist organizations, it may be you're able to do things quicker. But I don't think universities, as they are, are like um, uh, some businesses. I mean, I remember a, a chairman of a trust board that I sat on, a hospital trust board, who had been a major senior player in a very large bank, he said, when we talked about reorganization of the bank, we simply brought out from the board the new structure and told the staff that's what it was. Please don't hesitate to cope. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's, there's no way you could do that, as you know, either in a hospital or in... So it is about the continual explanation and the continual bringing of consensus. There's uh, someone there and then someone there, so... Black from the University of Glasgow, and I should say we've also got two people from uh, Wales here. So my, I'm interested in what UUK's perception is of just the implications of some of the divergence, say, in about five years' time, and what that also means to how we in Britain present universities to um, our international students and uh, staff. Uh, well, I mean, and there are, there are kind of two, two different problems in Scotland and Wales, as you're probably well aware. Um, I, I, I actually, interestingly, have a, a little more difficulty predicting what the situation would be like in Scotland in five or six years than I do in England, because there does seem to be a bit of money coming out of the sky philosophy to, uh, to fund this, and at some stage there's going to be a denouement of this, uh, and, uh, and, and how that's going to be handled by any future government, I think, is going to be quite challenging. I do think Scotland has done some very interesting things very early, like combined physics department, combined sciences departments, uh, to, you know, to, and, and there are already very positive outcomes from things like that. But I think that the finances are going to rest in, a, in a quite a considerable, I mean, I, you can tell me I'm wrong. I, I'm not from that part of the world, as you know, and we do allow University of Scotland to manage their own uh, uh, business, but, but that seems to me the key question going forward. As far as Wales is concerned, there is still a massive restructuring to be brought in to dock. And, and the outcome of that, I think, uh, will significantly impact uh, on, the, uh, 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 on the, st the shape of the universities and the whole functioning of the universities in Wales over a long period of time. And they also face the financial question in the same way as Scotland does. Gentleman over there. Thanks. Um, Simon Inger, University of Bath. Um, I, I just wanted to broaden out the leadership theme that you started on because I'm struck by your image of senior teams around the country closing the curtains and figuring out how they're going to get their university into the brave new world. And there's evidence that organisations that adapt, a feature of that is, is a sort of refreshment and rotation of some of the most senior leadership mm. positions to, to, because you need a different skill set when the world changes in your senior leadership. And I wonder if you think vice chancellors and governing bodies are re how ready they are to take a real honest and uh, um, ruthless look at the, the skill mixes in those most senior leadership teams. And, and what role do you think HR professionals have in that? Right, I, don't, we, I need to remind everybody I've been in post 11 years, by the way. <laughs> I mean, it's a very interesting paradox in what you say. The North American experience is the president's, the term of presidency of a North American university is decreasing in length annually. So presidencies of North American universities are down now to an average of four years. Yet the paradox is 
some of the most successful presidency, uh, universities have been associated with long-term presidencies. So I don't necessarily think that there is an a priori reason why you have to say things have to be of a limited amount of time. What they do in North America, of course, is, which we can't do here, is that they have fixed-term contracts. And so you can see that every five years there's a choice made about whether this individual is fit for purpose or not. And if they're not, the, the contract is not uh, renewed. Uh, that, of course, is not doable, as you will know only too well, and, under European law. So I think that, um, that uh, you know, the fitness and purpose of the senior team, I can tell you, is a constant discussion between myself and the chair of council. Constant discussion. Uh, the director of human resources will be involved in that. He'll also be part of the discussion. It's a he in our organization. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm interested in views. I, the other thing is that you owe, it's interesting, organize, obviously the leader of an organization owes a series of duties to the organization. The organization also owes some duties to the leader. And to take a 48-year-old and say, by the way, we're going to keep you for six years, and even if you do all right, by the way, we, we need to refresh things, and off you go at the age of 54 and try and find yourself a job in a post-vice-chancellor's life, it's not going to be easy. It's not an attractive option. Um, and uh, so the issue is, you know, do you have to predominantly appoint your vice chancellors so that they're towards the end of their professional career, so that they have a limited lifespan? Or do you take the risk-benefit analysis that if someone stays for a while, actually there is evidence that those people can do the organization a lot of good? I mean, I've certainly had to make a substantial shift to uh, from where I was in 2001, a time of suddenly resources coming in, you know, the world looking like expansion, very positive, great plans for investment, to a wholly different world now. Uh, I have to say, I'm rather glad I'm as experienced as I am, to be honest with you. But of course, my chairman of council could put his hand on my shoulder tomorrow and say, we think the uh, leadership needs refreshing, Eric. I, I think that's the term that's used, isn't it? I don't know if that's adequate in terms of an answer. Yeah, I, I wasn't aiming particularly at vice chancellors, but you know, I take your point about being experienced. So it's just I've had conversations with with institutions that have gone through quite big change, often crisis driven, right. adapting to a new world, and, and they've said well, key to our success was the fact that you know those people right. weren't up to it in the new world, and they had to be replaced by people who were, and and we, we needed to be very honest about the skills we needed in that position. It sounds like you're having those conversations, but I, I'm just Well, and, and everyone does have those conversations. I, just, as, just a final point. When I talk to incoming vice chancellors, I have to take, take them out for dinner and, and talk to them, I say one of the things that I didn't recognize when I started, and one of the major challenges you have, is the constant change to the senior team. I now do not have anybody in my senior team who was there in 2000 and six. And so that, you know, in, in our situation where pro-vice chancellors have limited terms of four and five years, one of the major challenges is there is that constant turnover. Thanks. Any other questions? I have a bit of, there's a question here, please. Mary Luckeram City University. Um, at a UC event, probably about 18 months ago, um, Eric, certainly be before you um, uh, became president, you were president-elect and might have therefore had more latitude in terms of what you said. Um, <laughs> there, was, there was a question raised, and in fact a similar question came up this morning with, with, with Nikki, uh, the, the, M the MP, um, over um, mergers and ac acquisitions. Um, and certainly in, in relation to her response sort of on behalf of the English government, it was that each institution is autonomous and it will govern its own future. Um, may, may we pose a similar question to you, which is how you see the landscape in five years' time in terms of the number of institutions that will still be around, uh, still be sustainable, still be successful, and, and whether you think there is actually some 
uh, pressure, whether indirect or direct, from, from, our, from our governments. I, I, I accept, exempt Wales from the question clearly because that's very evident what, what is happening, happening there. Yeah. Um, well, if I can answer the government one, uh, I, the, what Nicky said is the government's line. Uh, and and I'm, not, I'm not just being president of Universities UK here. Um, uh, that, that if you speak to uh, David Willits about this, he will say that universities are autonomous institutions and they must decide their own future. Um, and uh, it's not we think mergers and acquisitions are a good idea or a bad idea. You know, we expect the universities to react to whatever challenges they have in front of them at the time. I have a feeling there will be mergers. Um, I don't think, what, what, what you've got to look at is, is the trajectory of change. In fact, for the first year, the change is quite heavily buffered because we have years two, year three, year four, and year five in there on the previous regime. But then when you move to the second year, that buffer starts to disappear. And by the third year, it's almost completely disappeared. So this tightening of change is really going to make a difference in years two and three in this. That's when the, uh, the roosters are going to come home to roost. Um, and I, I think, I, and I've said this on numerous occasions, there are something like 42 separately governed higher education institutions within the M25. And my view is, if you want me to lay a bet, in 10 years' time there will be substantially less than 42 separately governed higher education institutions in that particular geography. There may well still be the buildings, they may well still be delivering higher education, but they will be delivering them, I'm sure, under the umbrella of a substantially smaller number of organizations. Now, is that transferable to other big cities? Um, uh, it's difficult, I mean, you know, it, it, there are possibly Manchester has that degree of size associated with it, um, but certainly I see inside London we are already doing all sorts of things. So, so if you take Bristol, for example, we would not consider now putting in a major, major grant to any of the research councils, particularly for things like doctoral training, without doing it with Bath and Exeter and Cardiff. And our one into the Arts and Humanities Research Council is going to go in with Reading as well. There is going to be a huge more uh, uh, of that kind of collaboration. And whether that leads to uh, uh, something more profound in the future, I honestly don't know. I mean, I've always said that, that in Bristol, the there's a clear, obvious business argument that as the University of Bristol and the University of West of England are in the same game, but as both vice chancellors would say, predominantly in different parts of the game, why don't you just merge and create a single uh, institution? To which the answer is to do with brands. And, and Steve West would argue he's got a brand and I would and we wouldn't do that. But, you know, will the, we will already talk about much more backroom working together, looking at that, you know, and will we have single uh, payrolls? And sing so I have a feeling that pressure to economize, in the way I described in my speech, will be the first thing that you see, and then you may see mergers and acquisitions in, uh, at a later date. There's another question which your question begs, and I may as well answer it, was uh, do I expect institutional failure to occur at some stage? And you can see a situation where it's possible for you, I mean, for a start, that universities have got themselves into trouble already in the past, we know that, so it's not as if the new changes necessarily precipitate. Um, but we will then come up against the questions of, you know, okay, if you decide to close an institution in a, in, in a 12 million person city, there's plenty of capacity to take that, that take that up. What if that's a single institution in a single city? Uh, if it starts to get itself into financial problems, it's so economically important to the city that it's in that actually, in inverted commas, allowing that institution to fail is not an option. It's not, it's not a social or political or economic option. Now, whether it would then merge with a university in a nearby city or whatever and, and become a branch campus of that university, I, I, I just genuinely don't know. Uh, but I, I, I think all of this will play out, and those are the dynamics I see happening. I think they might be wanting to take an early lunch. Are there any more questions? Yes, there's one down the front here. I'm quite happy for an early lunch, by the way. <laughs> the cultural importance of um, 
preserving the, the sector in terms of its long history of the way it works, but at the same time you're talking about the new and, and growing threats, if you like, uh, in terms of the private sector getting involved in delivering higher education. What, what, what would you be looking for from the HR function to address both the, the threat of the private sector but also the opportunity that it presents in the next few years? Right. I mean, in the final analysis, what is going to make a university successful is that it gets the highest quality staff inside it it possibly can. I don't think anything trumps that. So I want uh, HR to work inside with the senior team to create the very best environment that's going to attract the highest quality staff. Um, and that, of course, is about all sorts of things like working conditions, positive working environment, how the, how the place functions, what's the culture inside the place. Um, I've always said that, you know, particularly for an, if, we, if we look at our academics, which are in inverted commas the, in the academic world, the productive end of the spectrum, why would an academic come to a particular university? Well, first of all, they want the intellectual environment in which they can best flourish. They want the best colleagues they want that to be a place where they can function best intellectually. They then want the resources to go with that, if you don't mind. Can I have the labs, please? I need a couple of postdocs or whatever, or I need access to a decent library. Then they want to know where the place is. So is the city a place that they'd like to go to? Is it somewhere that's going to deliver a quality of life to them? Is it going to be good for their spouses and their children? And then finally, I would argue, they would want to know what they're getting paid for that but that's my that's the priority list and so the purpose what I want HR is to help sustain that priority list um, and I'm, I'm absolutely clear in my own mind that the working environment how they find working in the environment is crucially important I mean some of you will know that I've got history about this with Bristol's initiative in a positive working environment uh, the I've often said that when, when I arrived at the university, it was quite hierarchical in the way that it functioned, and it was quite clear, and, 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 I wasn't, and, and, the, and people weren't empowered in the way that I wanted uh, them to be, and I'd been used to in my previous university. And you know, what we wanted to do was to move to a situation where the whole environment felt much freer and, and more relaxed and more creative, and where people when I use the rugby ball, rugby analogy, you know, if they find the rugby ball in the middle of the pitch, they'll actually pick it up and run with it. Whereas we were having difficulty getting them even to pass it along the three-quarter line. Now, I think if that change can come about, if, if we can successfully bring that change about inside my own organisation, that will probably be the biggest and most important legacy that's been left behind. A group of empowered, creative people who feel they can get on and do their work uh, in a supportive environment. And that, I mean, you're right at the centre of doing that. Absolutely right at the centre of it in HR. Uh, two now. There's a gentleman, gentleman here and then a lady there. Yeah. Uh, hi, you can probably tell I'm from a remote colonial outpost. Oh, and, yes, uh, right. Yes, uh, we, we don't play very good rugby. John <laughs> Steele from the University of Wollongong. We've talked a lot this morning about public policy positioning of government and funding and those sorts of pressures. There's another set of pressures, technology and particularly the Americans, MIT, open curriculum and those sorts of things. And sometimes when you're obsessed with funding and mm. a bit of a siege mentality, do you think UK universities generally are well placed in terms of innovation and technology to maybe deflect some of those or remain competitive with those sorts of challenges that will come, I think, from increasingly prestigious US universities? Yes, I mean, there, there, if, if there are two kind of implications in your question, if I get it. One is about new technology, d distance learning, what you can do with that. Uh, and secondly, there's a kind of internationalization thing hanging over what, you know. And um, we're at the moment, we're in a, in, a, in a profound period where UK universities are heavily involved in internationalization in one sort or another. Um, I do think that they tend to look at it in, in what I would slightly call a kind of neo-colonialist way. In other words, just going out and, 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 and sort of 
our new product is higher education. I think there's another dimension to it about working with partners in really rather different ways. Um, and um, I, on the internationalization agenda, I think are in, in 20 years' time, try and think in 20 years' time, are we going to see an array of a relatively small number of very big universities that are global, global corp, that have campuses in Dubai and campuses in Beijing and campuses here, there, and, and they are literally, you know, a, a mini Toshiba? Or are we going to have lots of PhD theses on the uh, internationalization bubble in the first part of the 21st century. And actually, what will have happened is that those universities have indulged in that internationalization. They won't have been able to sustain it because the quality will be improving in the countries in which they're going to, and the model they're using isn't a particularly sustainable one, and they'll have retreated back to uh, being what they have traditionally been. And I'm not sure which of the two those are going to be. Um, in terms of um, uh, distance provision, we do, of course, have the world's very best university for distance provision in the open university. And if you go there and see the kind of innovation they're using, it's just astonishing, absolutely astonishing. And, um, I, you know, I, I don't know whether it's a question of open source, you know, open uh, uh, curricula or what, or it's, it's something even more uh, tectonic. I mean, we have a father who happens to be on our finance committee of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a uh, his son is at the university, and his son doesn't go to the lectures, he just gets the podcast of the lecture and sits in his room and goes through the podcast of the lecture, and it's great because he can repeat it and repeat it and go back and repeat it and repeat it. Now, that's a complete paradigm shift for me. I, could, I mean, I was, what? You know, it's an astonishing change. Now, what, how is that technology going to change things? How is the attitude of the people using the technology? I think we will all be very, very surprised by what's happening, but we can't predict it. How's your new vice chancellor, by the way? Is he settling in all right? He's going very well. Right, good. <laughs> Hello, I'm Louise, yeah, Louise Lindsay from Imperial College. I was interested going back to your point about the environment that you create um, for, for staff, and just wondering whether you're getting involved in any debate about whether that environment and the pay and conditions extends to contracted out workers as well, because obviously there's some pressure at the moment from government ministers and the Labour Party to lobbying uh, heads and vice chancellors on living wage for um, mm. institutions. And I think there are two schools of thought. One is that you know, pay policy and minimum pay rates are set by government and are not a matter for, for universities. And another would say that there were corporate social responsibility outside of widening participation. And I'd just be interested in your views on, on that. Well, uh, first of all, I, I think I have to speak as Eric Thomas rather than President of Universities UK, if you don't mind. Or, um, when I arrived at Bristol, I said that nobody should be paid under £10,000 a year. I didn't think that in a city in the southwest of England, £10,000 a year was anything less than that was a difficult wage for people to live on. Uh, and uh, I believe if there is a set national minimum wage, then my personal belief is that we should follow that. I, I just believe that. It's, these, are, um, these are tough times, and it's not easy uh, to, to live on the, on the national minimum wage as it is. Contracting out provides a series of other problems, which actually we haven't had to address uh, in our own institution, but I do understand that in, certainly in London institutions are a significant issue. I mean, I suppose the debate over port after dinner would be is, I, I always like to think of, um, I prefer not to think of rights and I like to think of duties because I think that makes a much better discussion. Does a university have a duty to ensure that all of the individuals that work inside it under any construct actually are paid a wage which enables them to live. And m my view is that as value-driven organizations, that we probably do have that duty. That's my personal view. But, you know, I'm not running <laughs> all of the institutions where these are critical issues. Um, but, but you do owe everybody who works in your institution a duty. 